In this lesson, we're going to talk about the Windows file system structures. So we talked previously about the fact that there was FAT32 and NTFS. Uh, now we're going to go a little bit more in depth in there. So file systems. What the file system does is it tells you how the, organized, how the data is going to be organized on your drive. How large can your files be? How efficiently can we store that data? How secure can the data be? And how can we access it by multiple operating systems? Um, so NTFS we talked about before, that's the preferred and default option for Windows, but if you need to interact with something like a, a uh, Macintosh system, it can only read from NTFS, it can't write to NTFS. And so if you have to go back and forth often with like an external hard drive, you may want to use something more like FAT32 or FAT64 because those will work on both. Uh, FAT32, which stands for File Allocation Cable, 32-bit, was supported by Windows XP. Um, but now in the newer operating systems, it can read and write to it, but for your main operating system, you're still going to want to use NTFS. Um, XFAT is a newer one that's coming online. It allows for larger file systems and, again, cross-platform uh, capability where it can be read and, write, read and written to by Windows, Linux, or Macintosh systems. But for us as Windows users, we're really going to be dealing with NTFS almost exclusively, the new technology file system. So when we deal with NTFS, we have all sorts of good features inside of NTFS. The first one that we deal with is what's called access control. And this is where we talked about before where I can say, for this particular file, I want Sarah to be able to read it, I want Joe to be able to write it, I want Jason to be able to read and write it, and I want um, Nick to be able to modify it. I can give individual files or folders permissions set down to an individual user or group of users. Um, Built-in compression. With NTFS, it actually is going to compress those files and folders for you, or even the entire drive, allowing you to shove more documents and more files onto a, a particular drive. Um, now note, when you do compress, you're going to lose a little bit of speed because you have to, compression is a um, processing capability, and then you have to decompress it before you can read it again. So you may or may not want to use it. Nowadays, with most systems, we have such large hard drives, compression is really not needed. But it was really helpful in the early days when drive sizes were getting too small. Um, partition limits. A practical limit right now is about 2 terabytes of size on an NTFS partition. So if you have a larger drive than that, you may want to break it into 2 or 3 or 4 partitions on one physical drive. Um, the nice thing about NTFS is there's an individual recycle bin in Windows for every user. So if I log onto the computer, and then I log off and my kid logs onto the computer, and I deleted something in my trash can, I put it in, in the recycle bin, with FAT32, we all shared one, one recycle bin. So if another user logged on, they could actually see your files that you threw away if you hadn't emptied the trash yet. Um, with NTFS, that doesn't happen. Everybody gets their own recycle bin. The other thing NTFS does is it has support for what's called the encrypted file system. It, it, it enables uh, the data to be stored in an encrypted format. Um, if you don't have the password, you're not going to be able to access to those files. Okay? This is a precursor to BitLocker. If you have the choice, you want to use BitLocker instead. BitLocker is much more secure and is much more stable and, and um, a, a much stronger algorithm. So if you're using um, Ultimate or Enterprise, you want to be able to use BitLocker. It works a lot better. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can do what's called drive mounting. It enables you to have a removable media drive's contents uh, access to them as if they were stored on your hard disk. So this sometimes is a little hard for people to understand. So we talked about before where we have our primary drive being like letter C. And normally when you plug in a drive, you get a le another letter. Like you plug in a thumb drive, it might mount as letter E for echo, right? The echo drive or external drive. Um, with mounting, you can actually, instead of giving it a drive letter, you can give it a subfolder off the main drive. So for instance, let's say I had an internal hard drive and a second internal hard drive. Instead of calling them C and D, I can call them C and then I can have a folder on C called extra space, like C colon slash X space, and that would actually push to that second drive so that both drives look like they're one drive, if that makes sense. Um, and I'll show you a picture of that a little bit later. We'll talk about that and I'll draw it up on the board for you guys. Um, but it allows you to do mounting of drives where you don't have to use a letter, you can actually mount it to a folder. Uh, disk quota support. Uh, the administrator of the system can actually give disk quotas for the users. So if I'm sharing a computer with my kid and I don't want him to take all his video games and data files and videos and take over my hard drive, I can actually allocate, say, 100 gigabytes for my kid and the rest of the drive for myself. And so if he goes up to 100 gigabytes, it'll say, sorry, you can't save any more data, you're out of space. We do this in business all the time. We give you permission to only write a certain amount of disk space, that way you don't take over the entire computer. 
um, hot swapping. Um, with NTFS, we can hot swap, which means that while the operating system is running, we can pull out a drive and put a new drive in. We do this all the time with thumb drives, external USB drives, or even um, uh, SATA drives have that ability. And the last thing is NTFS also does indexing. So it allows you to search much quicker and find the data you're looking for on that drive. With FAT, it actually would search through the entire drive looking for the data you were looking for. Um, this actually has an index so it can find that information quicker, uh, giving you quicker d drive access times. So lots of different features for NTFS. Overall, NTFS is better than FAT, right? We have encryption, uh, we have access control, um, we have disk quota support, lots of good things from NTFS. So file structures and paths. So one of the important things as a technician, especially if you're upgrading users, <clears throat> is to know where their documents are going to be stored at. So in Windows XP, we used to store things under the C drive, under the documents and settings, slash whatever that person's username is. So if my username was Jason, it'd be C colon slash documents and settings slash Jason. Okay? And then under that, I'd have a My Documents folder, a Desktop folder, a Cookies folder, a User Data, and other folders under there. All the stuff that I generate, like music and pictures and videos, are all sub-documents of the My Documents folder. It makes it really easy if you go to upgrade a machine and you're like, hey, I need to back up that person's personal photos, go into C colon slash documents and settings slash username slash my documents slash pictures and, and my pictures and that's where it'll be. If you go into Vista, they changed it up a little bit and it went into the C colon slash users slash username. So C colon slash users slash Jason. And then under there we have our documents, downloads, favorites, music, etc. We took out the my in front of all of them, right? And we changed that base from documents and settings to user. Windows 7, we kind of combined the two. Um, it came down to the C colon slash users, like Vista did, but then the folders underneath it threw the my back into it. So it's my documents, my music, my pictures, my videos, etc. right? All those things are subfolders underneath that C colon slash users, okay? Um, in this, in, when you're looking for program files, um, if you're using a 64-bit operating system, it has two folders that they put the program files in. One is in the C colon slash program files. That's where your 64-bit programs go in. And then there's another one called Program Files, parentheses, x86, as you can see on the bottom of the screen here. And that's where all your older 32-bit programs go into. Now, do you really care which folder it goes into? Not necessarily because the installer is going to do it for you. But if you're looking for a particular program and you're not finding it under Program Files, it may be a 32-bit program, so check the x86 folder. That's the real reason for knowing that's there. Uh, you can see here is a picture on the bottom left side. We have the C drive going into the Users folder the user's name, and then he's got his desktop, pictures, documents, music, etc. This is just a tree map to show you different files, uh, different folders underneath. And if you go into the, um, uh, th this picture at the top here is from Vista, you can see a picture of underneath the user's folder where he has his documents, videos, music, favorites, etc. Command line tools. So we use our command line tools to do different operations and management of our operating systems. To get to the command line interface, which is the, called the CLI, um, also known as the command prompt, we go to start run and then we type in command cmd.exe and hit enter or OK. Uh, if you do that, it'll pop up with something that looks like this image on the right side. The one on the top right side, c colon slash documents and settings slash json. What type of system is that? Vista, 7, or XP? XP, right? Because documents and settings, right? If it was C colon slash user slash JSON, it'd be either Vista or 7, right? Um, we have things called internal and external commands. We talked about this way back on day one in lesson one. Um, internal commands are automatically loaded by Windows upon booting. Things like directory, change directory, delete, just basic things that you need for file system operations. Uh, external commands are ones that are loaded from the hard drive by the user. Things like defragmentation of the hard drive or Word if you want to type up a document. Those are extra programs, they're external commands, okay? So that's the difference between internal and external. So we're going to talk about a couple of command line tools here. Uh, we have defrag. Defrag is an external command, and it's used to clean up your hard drive and get rid of discontinuous files. So what happens is, as you write, read and write to the hard drive, and you delete a file, it leaves holes in the hard drive, or free space in the hard drive. And the next time you go to write stuff, it's going to find the extra holes that are empty. And so if I have a file that's bigger than a file that you just deleted, it's going to put part of it to write where the old file was and part of it someplace else on the drive. 
So when I go to read that file, I've got to go to two different places on the drive to get it. That's what's called a discontinuous file. It'll slow down your performance. So every so often, if your drive gets too fragmented, we'll do a disk defrag where we'll actually put all the file pieces back together in one continuous block. Okay? If you think of it like if you had to store stuff in a filing cabinet and you didn't have enough room in the top shelf, so you had to put some on the top shelf and some on the bottom shelf. I told you to go get the stuff. Now you have to go to two places, the top shelf and the bottom shelf, to get it, right? If you had it all on the top shelf, it would be a lot easier. And that's the idea of defrag, is we're going to rearrange the filing cabinet, the hard drive in this case, so all the files are continuous and on the top shelf, on the middle shelf, on the bottom shelf, as pieces together, so we can grab them all at once. Uh, NT Backup is a text-based program used to backup files and folders. Uh, there's a graphical one called Backup now in Vista and 7 that you can use as well. Uh, check Disk, C-H-K-D-S-K, is used to check your hard disk for physical errors. Essentially, it's going to go through the entire hard disk and look at the surface of all of the sectors and plat on the platter and make sure that it's good. Um, there's a graphical one if you go through Drive Property Sheet and go to Disk Cleanup, or you can do the text-based one like I'm showing on this screen here. And it will actually look through the entire hard drive and mark any sectors that are bad so that you don't write data to those bad sectors. Okay? Um, format. Uh, we did a format when we installed. We had to format the disk. We basically erase everything on the disk, and we are partitioning out or sorry, not partitioning, but we're, we're sectoring out the hard disk so we're ready to use, so we're ready to write to it. Um, to do this from the graphical interface, you can do it through the disk management console, which you can get to from my computer, manage, and disk management console. And we'll play with this when we go and do our labs later on so you guys will get familiar with who all these tools are. Or you can do it from the command line. If you want to format the D drive, for instance, it's really easy. You type in format, space, D colon, enter, and it will format that drive for you. So if you plug in like a uh, external hard drive or a USB, that's how you can format it. So folder management. Um, our files and folders are managed by the command line using text-based, or we can use our Windows Explorer, which is our GUI-based, which is graphical user interface. If we're doing it from the command line, MD stands for make directory. So if I want to make a directory called JSON, I would do MD space JSON. Uh, if I wanted to change the directory and go into that directory I just created, I would do cd space json. If I wanted to remove a directory, I would do rd space json, and it would delete that directory for me. So that's md, cd, and, and rd. Um, over on the right, I have a couple other ones shown there, like deleting a file, renaming a file, or copying a file. Uh, down in the Windows Explorer, you're using the GUI. You're pointing and clicking, right? It makes it a lot easier for us. Uh, we can right-click on the driver of the directory and make a new folder by creating a new folder, renaming a folder, or deleting a folder just by using our mouse and keyboard. Uh, the nice thing about the Explorer is we can go forward and backwards, up and down very easily. Um, the bad thing about the Explorer is if you're remotely controlling somebody's computer, you've got to wait to be able to see what you're doing, right? Whereas with text-based, it's immediate feedback. It's much quicker. From an administration standpoint, if you're doing a lot of remote support, learning your own command line tools are going to be essential. Um, we're not going to go really in-depth into command line stuff here. There are entire courses dedicated just to command line um, to learn all the details of it. But we will touch it a little bit uh, to give you guys a little bit of experience. So folder options in the graphical user interface. So if we go to our folder and we go to the options, you can access your Windows Explorer. And by default, your menu bar is going to be hidden uh, in Windows 7 and Windows Vista. To show it, if you hit Alt and T on your keyboard, it will show it. And then you can go down to Options, and you'll be able to see the folder options here, like I'm displaying. Um, if you want to show that permanently, you can go to Organize, Layout, and then Menu Bar. That way you'll get that File, Edit, uh, View, etc. shown. Once you get into the folder options, you can make changes under Files and Folders. You can see here where we can always show our icons and never show thumbnails. We can show menus. Uh, we can display the icon. Do we want to show that last three-digit extension, like when you have a Word file, um, you know, document.txt or document.doc. Do you want to show that .doc or not? That's something you can do. Um, do you want to show hidden files or not show hidden files? Hide the extensions or not, sh not hide the extensions? Things like that are all things you can control from the folder options. For most users, we want to end up hiding the extensions. We want to hide the protected system files. But if we're doing some work, we may need to see that information to be able to change it. So file management. Um, it's very similar to folder management. You can create, rename, and delete files. Um, you can do this in the graphical user environment by right-clicking and going New File. Um, new files can be specifically linked to different programs. For instance, you can have a PDF file, which is an Acrobat file, um, like a, a digital textbook, for instance. 
You can have an MP3, which would be audio, a JPEG, which is a picture, a ZIP, which is a compressed archive, XLS is a spreadsheet, DOC is a Word document. All of these things have different file extensions. Those three letters are what we call the extension. And by looking at that, we can know what type of program will open that particular file. Um, if you want to open it, just double click it with your left mouse and it will open the file for you. It executes it. Uh, you have three different types of or two different types of files that we talk about. We have what's called binary files, for example, program files, exe, executables, or comms, command files. Uh, or you can have text files, things like a .bat or .txt. Uh, BAT is a batch file for scripting. TXT is text file. DOC is document file. Okay? Um, these are just examples of file extensions that last three digits like we talked about. All of the ones on the right are different examples of those three digit extensions for different types of file formats. Every file has attributes associated with it. <clears throat> just like we as people have attributes, right? I have the attribute of having hazel eyes and brown hair, right? Um, yeah, that kind of stuff. Well, these files will also have attributes. In the graphical environment, <clears throat> if you right click it and go to properties on the file, you'll be able to see those attributes. For instance, I have highlighted here the created and modified time for this particular file. Uh, we also have the last time it was accessed. We have whether it's read only or hidden. And we also have advanced where we can get into all of these other attributes as well, such as archive, read only, system, hidden, compression, or encryption. With archive, it's actually going to say whether or not this file has been backed up recently or not. It has this archive bit that's either on or off, and the NT backup will use that to know which files to back up. Uh, read only means the file can be read, but it can't be changed. You can't change the text. You can't delete the file. System is just to warn you that, hey, if you delete this file, you may mess up your system because it's used by Windows. So there's a special marking for that. Hidden. If you have the hidden bit checked, that means that it's not going to show up when you're looking in the folders. So it hides it, and you only will be able to see that if you have the show hidden files enabled. Uh, compression allows you to compress the file size. Uh, and encryption allows you to use the encrypting file system to restrict access and encrypt that file. Attributes that can be changed or modified can either be done using the attrib command, which stands for attribute. Uh, so attrib plus r would add read only. Attrib minus r would take away read only. Uh, that kind of stuff. And then in the GUI, you can right click and get to the file properties like I'm showing you here, and you'll be able to check or uncheck the, the um, check boxes as needed to make those file attributes the way you want them. Again, most things you can do in the command line, you can do in the GUI. It just depends on which one you want to do. Once you get fast with command line, it can be a lot faster to use the command line over the GUI. So here's a uh, sample question for you guys. You're working on a computer using XP, and you need to back up the user's pictures. Where would they be located? Users slash my pictures, program files slash my pictures, program files slash my pictures, or documents and settings slash username slash my documents slash my pictures. D, right? Uh, XP is going to be documents and settings, username, my documents, my pictures. The one at the top there, C colon slash, user slash my pictures is for seven. Uh, when we went to my pictures, it went back to seven. If it just said pictures, then it would be Vista. Uh, 